Well, good morning. This is uh, Victor Branch. I am the chair of the Richard Blank Committee of the College of William and Mary. And we're so happy to have everyone with us this morning for our board meeting for September via Zoom. And uh, what a beautiful morning it is. Beautiful, bright sunshine, nice, crisp fall air. Um, we've got a lot to cover this morning, so we'll jump right in. Uh, first thing we'll cover is the is there a motion to approve the minutes from May 12th and our August 18th? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor say aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. do a roll call. Do a roll call. Uh -huh. we typically do. Then let's do let's do a roll call. Been moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Branch? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. Hudson's not here. Judge Poston? Aye. Ms. Roday? Aye. Ms. Schultz? Aye. All right. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Keep us keep us on track, Mr. Fox. Well, I'd like to welcome all the participants and members of the public watching on YouTube. Uh, please note all audio should be muted for board members and staff members who wish to participate. Please identify yourselves when you speak. Today, the Richard Blank Committee is meeting virtually in accordance with item 4-0.01-G of the 2020 Appropriations Act, which provides governing boards with the ability to hold meetings electronically without a quorum present while the Commonwealth is under a state of emergency. Uh, just to kick off my remarks, which are few, I just wanna thank Dr. Sadow and her wonderful leadership team for getting the school year launched with uh, little to no hiccups, given all that we're dealing with in this uh, trifecta crisis period of a pandemic, a uh, economic crisis, and a social unrest. We were able to get the, the school year launched and Everyone seems to be getting into their routines and we are as a board looking forward to getting updates from uh, Dr. Sadow and the team on how the campus is operating in this new normal. But thank you for your focused, dedicated leadership following the guidelines under the Statesman Secure uh, Plan and getting everyone uh, safely into uh, their routines. So with that said, Dr. Sato, I am gonna turn things over to you to give us your opening and offer, and offer remarks and your update, so thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good morning. We're all delighted to be here, including four students who are joining us today, and they will be speaking with you directly and uh, entertaining any questions that you have. Uh, about their experience during this very unusual fall semester. So I know that that will be the highlight of our meeting, but I would ask that we jump right in and provide the administrative report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you asked that each of us give introductions. I'm Debbie Saito, I'm president of Richard Bland College. Lisa Pond in my office is moving the slides. So Lisa, let's go on. Um, this is a celebratory occasion for the college, even as we are in week five of uh, fall semester, that is, as all of you know, unlike anything that any of us have experienced previously, we recently received news that RBC is listed on the SAC COC website as removed from warning. This was relative to standards 13.1 and 13.2, uh, having to do with financial sustainability and reporting. Um, these are live links, and I would urge you to take a look at the SAC COC website that has entered into their database the uh, reaffirmation of accreditation in 2020. That is extraordinarily positive for our institution. This is a, a milestone in the life of any institution to receive decennial uh, reaffirmation of accreditation. Lisa, if you'll move on to the next slide, please. 
Um, this is what our timeline looks like tracking toward the next decennial reaffirmation in 2029. Um, I know that that sounds like it's a long time from now. However, there are steps in getting to that place. In 2023, uh, we will receive notification from the SAC COC president. And in 2024, the fifth year interim report is due. So uh, Stacy Sokol, who is our SAC COC liaison, is working with RBC's Institutional Effectiveness Committee. Uh, they have already begun to ensure that we are tracking data appropriately for that fifth year interim report. So that as we move forward, submit that report in 2024, we will then be within range of beginning a new self-study in 2026, 27, with that reaffirmation occurring um, and that standard three-year process uh, that leads up to the June 2029 reaffirmation of accreditation. So that is the process. I would ask uh, anyone uh, if there are any questions about where we stand with SAC COC or um, any comments. President Sada, I would just say congratulations on that excellent news and all the hard work, focus, and dedication the team put into getting us fully credit has been has paid off, and we applaud you and thank you for that great thank leadership. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else? Well, well we will move right along um, and just introduce a topic that is um, something the team has been working on, including Cassandra Stanberry, who is RBC's Director of Human Resources, Paul Edwards, our uh, Chief Business Officer, and Ramona Taylor, a uh, legal counsel who is now uh, on the Zoom call. So we are uh, essentially basing a faculty early retirement incentive plan on Virginia state code that you see in front of you now. Um, this gives governing boards of each institution of public higher education in Virginia, the authority to establish a compensation plan designed to provide incentives for voluntary early retirement of teaching and research staff employed in non-classified faculty positions. Participation in the plan is voluntary for eligible employees, um, and you will hear what those eligibility requirements are in a moment, and no employee shall be penalized in any way for not participating. This is directly out of code. Uh, this code provides the basis for the plan that we have drafted, and we'll share with you now. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, students, faculty, staff, good morning. My name is Paul Edwards. I'm the Chief Business Officer for Richard Blaine College. As you can see at the top there, the statement, making the most of every available resource is paramount. That is a core statement within our newly approved strategic plan, Seize Your Potential. And keeping with that, the strategic goal number three calls for operational sustainability. And our retirement plan is one of those means in uh, sustaining campus resources. After our analysis so far, preliminary uh, indications show that if implemented in FY21, we would have a net cost savings of around $900,000 through FY24. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I am Cassandra Stanberry, the Director of Human Resources for Richard Bland College. So recently, uh, the preliminary HR, legal and financial analysis um, were completed. Um, in HR's review, we identified eight faculty members who would be eligible for the faculty early retirement incentive plan three of which are VRS members and five ORP members. 
depending on the individual faculty retirement plans, whether it's VRS or ORP, um, we do have incentives that are under consideration. And three are listed here, uh, VRS service payout, which is similar to the enhanced retirement plan for classified employees, um, cash payout, and health insurance stipends. Thank you. Ramona? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone, and I apologize for being late. I'm having internet issues here at the AG's office, and I wish I could see everyone's smiling face this morning. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of background on um, what we are hoping to do in the statutory provisions um, that drive what we are doing. Um, as uh, Dr. Sido indicated, under um, the Virginia Code, the board has the authority to establish these plans. And what we're hoping to do in establishing this plan is to um, is to go in line with several of the initiatives that the the committee has uh, the committee and the board have already approved. But what what we're doing is the reason we're taking this approach now is because there is uh, a workflow that we have to comport with, and that is mand what we believe is mandated by the code. But what we're also doing is we're going to seek some additional guidance from the Office of the Attorney General to make sure that we are fully complying with the expectations of the governor's office, looking to see if we need some additional input from the experts here at the attorney general's office. So we are presenting a consistent plan. So what we're trying to do really is mitigate any uh, confusion or potential risk for uh, the college in developing this plan. Have I covered everything that I needed to cover? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Lisa okay. is pulling up the, the resolution itself, Ramona, that you okay. uh, have drafted. And uh, we just wanted to put this in front of the committee because this is the um, essentially the skeleton of the resolution that we would bring to you in November. Uh, once the plan is fully established with all of the policy documents, um, the documents related to application, et cetera. So Ramona, can uh, I imagine you are not able to see this, but you should have a copy of it. Would you prefer yeah. that I cover it? Well, since I, I can't pull it up, I'm literally my whole system is down. Yes, but I did want to also add this. Remember, we're distinguishing this. Also, early retirement is, as as Cassandra has said, is 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 voluntary. This is distinguished from, and so we don't want to create confusion. That's why we're presenting it now, as, as it relates to enhanced retire uh, a re enhanced retirement. Uh, plan. So um, recognize that because this is new um, for a lot of institutions, this is something that has significant, will have significant impact and benefit, I believe, for the college. And so we just wanted everyone to be clear on why we're, why the college is taking this step and why it's offering this information now because there will, it's going to take us time to not only develop, but in, in the event we need approval, we will, we have create, we have put in enough um, space in the timetable to obtain those approvals. So the resolution itself um, has a number of whereas statements that speak to the college's strategic plan, as has already been mentioned. This initiative falls directly within the focus of the strategic plan uh, around sustainability in particular, but it also supports other initiatives of the college relative to um, essentially proper management of all resources, including human resources, and um, ensuring that we have adequate flexibility uh, as the college continues to evolve uh, post COVID. There is also, um, recognition uh, that this uh, plan does sit within the Code of Virginia. That is the third whereas statement. 
Uh, the fourth whereas statement uh, simply speaks to the board's um, authority to uh, approve such a plan and affirms that it does tie to the college's strategic plan and the resolved statements uh, does essentially establish the plan and there is also recognition um, that the um, approval is going to ensure that we are then, as uh, Ramona said, able to continue with the workflow uh, once the AG's office has sorted all of that out. Any questions? I, I do have a question. Uh, thank you so much to all the faculty and particularly to those who are um, uh, anticipating retirement. Um, this certainly sounds like a, um, a very good opportunity. I was just wondering if there's anything that we need to be aware of of the downsides uh, uh, to this um, proposal. I would defer uh, to the team. Paul, Cassandra, Ramona. Okay. Well, um, I can, at this point, we don't anticipate um, a downsize unless we're looking at, um, I would say, staff or faculty that are in the midst of helping us with any initiative they may elect and then we have to make adjustments with staffing of those committees. Um, also, um, recognize that we are we are polling other institutions to get additional information on what they find to be uh, the pluses and minus of this because we don't want to, we want you to know we're not operating in a vacuum. We do have some institutions that we are polling and obtaining information and some guidance from to make sure we consider all of the, the relevant uh, points, the relevant benefits and the relevant risks um, in developing this type of plan? I think from an HR standpoint, um, the downside to to this plan um, for us is just losing the knowledge, um, you know, that some of the faculty members have. The longevity that they have in the college is very critical and very important to us. Um, it, it's not looked at in a negative light because again, it is voluntary. Um, for these individuals, they do not have to, we're not forcing anyone into this um, early retirement incentive plan. Um, but, you know, in an effort to sustain the college, um, we are also, as we look at these options and knowing that we're going to lose this knowledge, you know, um, we're looking at sustainability um, and we're also looking at succession planning. Um, how we're going to replace them and what's going to be in the best interest of the college as we continue to move forward with our uh, strategic plan, um, seizure potential. Paul, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, ma'am. At, at this time, there's not a financial downside. So nothing, nothing recognized financially. It's positive financially. Any other questions? Um, again, we will be submitting this plan in the November packet for your full review, uh, but we're eager to get your input. So if you have any specific questions, please ask any member of the team and we will uh, get you any additional information that you may need. Okay. Um, Lisa will pull up the PowerPoint. Good morning, I'm Dr. Maria Desenberg and I'm Provost for Richard Blaine College. And I just wanna start by saying about a month ago, we were all uh, very torn about how to proceed with fall semester. And I have to, that's not me. <laughs> um, but I haven't even had a chance to mention to Dr. Saito that I, I received a call last night from a parent that's the beauty of technology today is all my calls from the office forward directly to my cell phone. But I'm glad I picked it up. Uh, it was a parent who has a daughter who's living in the dorms. And she was calling on behalf of her daughter because her daughter was interested in finding out if we were going to reassess 
visits, visitation privileges in the dorms, like if if they could start bringing friends in because things were going so well. And of course, I launched into a whole thing about, well, if each student in the dorms brought in a friend, that would be an additional 200 people, and then what would happen? Um, it was very understanding, and I guess my point was, the call ended with her being very thankful for the way that our campus um, safe and secure plan has been set up and that her daughter is doing really well. And her thanking us. So I extend that to Dr. Saito and the team and all of us, just that it was a very positive call and um, one a story of one student doing well. Um, before I jump into a few highlights of the enrollment uh, report, I would like to give a student services update. The pandemic has challenged us a great deal, uh, challenging us to get virtual and be good at, at being virtual. And, um, and one of the big priorities for us is making sure that students have access to resources and support. In addition, with the Seize Your Potential strategic plan, we are engaged in looking at how to roll out online and distance education programs in a cost-effective manner. Um, and this means ensuring that we have services in place that will support geographically dispersed students. So in support of these goals, um, we, as you may know, we rolled out an online bookstore as well as virtual ADA services and the records and registration function. Um, so offering these virtual options really are critical um, to ensuring an unmatched student experience. So we're excited about these new changes. On to the enrollment update. I'll ask Lisa to move to the next slide. Um, and a little bit about pre-COVID, our pre-COVID story. We were tracking really strong for fall. Uh, as you can see here, we were ahead in all funnel points of the admissions area. Um, and the one thing I'll highlight is that the team had brought our registration cycle much earlier. So you can see here, we were trending ahead in March with fall registrations. And then if you move to the next slide, you can, you can see some more detail on our admissions activity. Um, but I will say with all of the issues, we did increase our total new student applications and admits. Uh, and then the other thing I'll point out here is that pandemic or no pandemic, we continue to serve um, these eight feeder schools in the central Virginia region. Um, and on the next slide, I'll point you to the bottom right uh, with respect to where we are today. Um, these numbers were pulled a few weeks ago, and as of yesterday, we were sitting at 827 students uh, with about 10,843 credit hours. That is below prior year. However, the team has collaborated to launch a September start. It's a late start, which starts next next week and we currently have about 128 applications for that which is going to bring our numbers up pretty nicely and we're also serving about 176 virgo study abroad students in addition to the traditional student population and then on the last slide um i think it's important that we um highlight the fact that we're serving a lot of different students um with COVID, the demographic changes, we've seen some shifts with internationals and athletes, um, the hiatus with our athletic program and also visa and travel regulations have impacted our internationals and athletes. They're down by about 50%. Um, 22 of our internationals are studying from overseas and we're pretty proud to note that in addition to many of the countries already represented, we've added a Malaysian student, a student from Azerbaijan and one from Cambodia this year. Uh, residential numbers you, uh, everyone anticipated would be down because of de-densification. Um, and the last thing I'll highlight here is that dual enrollment, we're in the process of um, getting these students all entered in, and we anticipate we'll come in even at about 1,400 students, which is about 6,500 credit hours. And that's the enrollment update at a very high level. Good morning again, everyone. So I'm Paul Edwards, the Chief Business Officer, and I'm gonna just over the next few minutes uh, update you on some budget items. 
So if you recall back in May, I had said that we would bring a new budget in the fall. And so we're gonna go through some of those items. Um, we have reforecasted our budget, though we are waiting on our friends in Richmond to finish uh, their work. So we don't have the budget for you to approve uh, this time. We will bring that to the next meeting, the final budget. In re-forecasting, we have a $1.2 million decrease in budgeted revenue. As Maria mentioned, this is due to decreased enrollment, which is due to COVID-19. The largest reductions are in the areas of the comprehensive fee, the housing revenue, and dining revenue. To give you a little flavor for the modality mix, we've had a, a huge shift. Typically in other years, in typical years, we have 83% in-state students, 5% out of state, and then 12% is online. Currently, right now in this semester, we have 37% in-state, 1% out of state, and 62% online. This, this large shift has accounted for the $1.2 million adjustment we've had to make. Onto the expenses, so in balancing that we've rebalanced the budget, so we also have a $1.2 million decrease in budgeted expenses. This has come primarily through salary savings. Uh, we've targeted personnel reductions and through natural attrition. Um, this is also through operation reductions, specifically uh, some areas are in auxiliaries. Uh, athletics, as you're aware, athletics is on hiatus for the, for the fiscal year. And then some other miscellaneous expense reductions and again, we've rebalanced the budget, we've, we've made those adjustments, and now we are just pending action from the General Assembly to finalize our state appropriation number. And onto the next slide, Lisa. And then um, we will bang, bring a balanced budget, including their, their uh, new appropriation number, if it happens to change, uh, to you in November. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Jeff Brown. I'm the Director of Special Projects and Operations. As uh, Dr. Saito mentioned, we're beginning already the fifth week of our fall semester, and I thought it would be appropriate to update you on the Safe and Secure Plan. Um, we received a Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services grant in the amount of $47,000 uh, to provide emergency supplemental funding. Um, RBC was the only college that was awarded this grant. Historically, it goes to um, other municipalities and, and state agencies, but we were able to uh, provide enough justification to support this request. Um, the neat thing about this grant is that is that it's retroactive back to January, so we'll be able to use these dollars to pay for uh, different uh, personal uh, protective equipment that we had to purchase, foggers that we're using in the classroom, different masks and other equipment like that. And the grant will uh, continue through March of 2021. Additionally, uh, the college was able to execute a contract uh, with VCU Health for virtual urgent care services um, we're the first college to enter into such a contract with VCU Health. Um, it's an amazing program. We're able to um, provide and work with students uh, with um, the telemed system that VCU Health has. Uh, students can get on to the um, telemed services through their telephone or computer. They speak directly to a doctor anytime between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. and the doctor can provide direction, uh, triage services, and uh, prescription orders. So um, we found this to be a very effective uh, program. We're really excited to be offering it to our student community. We, uh, about three or four weeks ago, we set up our safe and secure dashboard. Uh, the design of this is to let our community see how we're doing compared to Crater Health District, to the Commonwealth of Virginia, to give it some context, uh, as well as the, com the uh, communities in which we reside, Dinwiddie and, and Prince George County. Um, this is an actual shot of the, of the dashboard from last week. 
um, and our numbers are, are doing pretty good. Um, we've had no positive cases on the campus at this point. A couple other things that we've completed are uh, COVID mandatory training and pledge, which uh, is required by all students, faculty and staff to complete as well over 80%. Um, I think this morning it was tracking at about 86%. So I think that's a pretty good completion rate. Um, we have implemented our face covering policy. We implemented that on the, by the first day of classes and we've had significant um, compliance with that. Uh, we have hall monitors in the academic buildings that make sure that students, faculty and staff are wearing their face coverings and we've just had no reason to um, intervene otherwise. They're, they're uh, following the directives and, and we're excited to see that type of compliance on our campus. Uh, between um, student services and human resources and our partners at Crater Health District, we developed a return to campus document so that if in the event an individual has been exposed to a COVID patient or uh, has a positive test result, um, there are policies and procedures now in place that tell us very specifically when that individual can return to campus. I thought it was important to share with you the uh, relationship that we have with Crater Health District. Um, this partnership has been one of the things I think that has kind of carried the, the college through successfully thus far. Um, in October, we're working already with the Crater Health District to develop our flu clinic. Um, flu shots have already been, vaccinations have already been secured and, and we'll be setting that up uh, most likely in, in the, uh, the gymnasium for uh, a safe and secure flu clinic for our community. Uh, the health district has helped us in the development of our virtual care, uh, urgent care agreement with VCU Health. They've worked with us in developing the protocols and, and steps uh, to make that successful. Um, they've already provided training to our, our, our RAs uh, so that they know how to handle cases in the residence halls. And they've helped us with uh, our reporting documents that, uh, that we need to submit regularly to the health district. And, and a really amazing, uh, they provide us case by case guidance as needed. Um, we've had a couple of incidents where we're just not sure what the right, right course of action is and we can call them and they're very quick to provide us with that guidance. So the uh, library has taken on a project to capture the community life during COVID-19. Um, it's, I'm kind of excited about this. I would have never thought to do this, but um, a decade from now, it's gonna be really interesting to, I think, to others how we handled this. And so the library is collecting um, firsthand experiences and stories, and they're storing them in the archives and special collections section. And um, I think that that'll be an interesting uh, read at some point in the future. Stacy Sokol. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I am Stacy Sokol, Director of Online and Continuing Education Programs. I'm excited this morning to share briefly about the progress that has occurred and continued planning associated with Richard Bland's move into online and continuing education programs. As we have shared today and over the past few months, RBC is committed to strategic initiatives that will expand the college's reach to new markets. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified the college's commitment to new distance education initiatives. I, along with Dr. Tyler Hart and additional members of the RBC administrative team, have been actively engaging with potential industry partners to identify and develop specialized curriculum in the form of industry certifications with applicable work experience to feed the workforce pipeline in areas such as coding and computer science and advanced manufacturing. 
I would like to thank Henry Broadus at William & Mary for facilitating several of the introductions to content providers as we continue to develop our plan. The specialized curriculum would lead to an RBC stackable credential of approximately 15 credits that could stand alone and enable students to be workforce ready or be paired with RBC's liberal arts and general education courses to lead to an RBC associate's degree. Once students earn the RBC associate's degree, they would have the option of gaining industry employment and or transferring to a four-year partner institution to complete their baccalaureate studies. Next slide. This slide provides a snapshot of the work currently in place and expected over the next year. We are currently working with SEI Ventures to vet media-rich courses that we can offer to a new population of non-traditional students. In addition, we are working to finalize a partnership with EAB to assist with enrollment services and program marketing for partnership of these new ventures. Many of you may remember David Cullen, who is a principal at EAB, who led the work college project completed by the VCU Executive MBA program during the spring 2020 semester. He continues to be involved um, with us, um, with the work being done by EAB that we anticipate to be completed over the next year, which will offer continuity and insight towards RBC's quest to make education available to new populations of students that will ultimately incorporate the work component. Finally, we are vetting opportunities to offer credit for prior learning via ACE approved coursework. This would allow students who have previously stopped out the opportunity to pick up their studies again and potentially earn credit for experience or previous completed work while then picking up additional courses here at RBC. We plan a soft launch of approximately 15 to 18 credits in the spring of 2021 while continuing to ramp up our partnership with EAB and finalizing the specialized curriculum with industry partners. Finally, beginning next fall, we plan to fully launch the general education component comprised of 45 credits, along with the 15 credits of specialized curriculum to combine for a full RBC associate's degree. And along the way, we will proceed through the RBC shared, RBC shared governance and SAC COC accrediting notification and approval process. Um, I'm looking forward to this launch in the spring, as well as the full development in fall of 2021. Mr. Chairman, is it posted? Can I ask a question, please? Absolutely. Stacey, could you talk a little bit more about the cooperation you had with Henry Broadus? What, what was that involved? Sure. Um, Henry was able to um, facilitate a conversation with us and with a number of, of potential partners, um, but um, SEI Ventures um, is the um, SCI, which is Strategic Education Incorporated, is the parent company of Strayer and Capella Universities. Um, and they have a number of, of ventures, one of which is a coding boot camp one that is specific to females and another that um, is available to um, any population of students wishing to undertake that study. Um, the president or not of the, the, the partner, the piece that includes that coding um, camp is actually a William and Mary graduate. Um, and so he initially contacted Henry, you know, about opportunities and the, what they were looking to do um, seemed to better align with what RBC is looking to do to make opportunities available in an online space um, to a new population of students, you know, underserved students um, who would not normally be in this market. So, um, you know, Henry introduced us um, to Terry McDonough and his, um, team and we've been working over the past few months to develop this curriculum that will uh, um, eventually include the coding camps as well as they have um, 
general education online courses that are um, have already been um, approved actually are available to um, a number of universities that we can begin offering very shortly. So with an expected um, turnaround of the spring of 2021. Thank you. And Paul, can, do you have any figures or comparison of the cost of educating a student and virtually as opposed to actual presence on campus? Say a per course type of cost? Uh, Judge Poston, I do. So I have a variety of cost figures. I don't have them right in front of me. I can always send you them offline. Um, but yes, we run a variety of analysis uh, looking at the various costs, cost of instruction and that sort of thing. Judge Excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm finished, Dr. Slatter. Oh, Judge Poston, I was just going to say your uh, questions are um, extremely timely and uh, very uh, appropriate. We have uh, Paul and his team, I I'm going to avoid using the royal we, uh, Paul and his team have really done uh, an outstanding job of get digging into and getting this kind of cost information, uh, slicing and dicing that information in a variety of ways. And frankly, part of um, that effort has been related to looking at um, a number of uh, projects and initiatives that we have underway to be certain that when we are contemplating various, uh, various cost savings initiatives or the reallocation of resources for investments in programs like the program that Stacy has just described, that we really, uh, you know, are leaving very little to chance, that we understand cost implications at a fairly deep level. So I, I just want to say, I want to give props to, to Paul and his team for their work um, to help us have that level of information, which to your point, I think is extremely important. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? We're, we're all very excited as a college, as a team. We're very excited about this new online initiative. You've heard us talking about it um, for a couple of years now. And I, I also just want to say Stacy Sokol has been uh, very bullish in, in making certain that the research um, you know, ha has revealed to us the, the many options, and there are many options for how an institution can get into this space. Uh, she has led an effort that has been very collaborative with our faculty, um, and I, I believe that we're in a very good position. Mr. Chairman, that uh, I believe that is the end of our report. And um, I, I know that all of you are going to be excited to hear from Dr. Birdsong and uh, the student panel this morning. That's a great update. And thank you everyone for sharing that with us. And a lot of good news in that report and a lot of exciting news uh, in the future. So bright. So thank you for your hard work and your commitment. Yep, let's turn to our faculty rep and our students. Great, good morning, everyone. This is Tiffany Birdsong. It's nice to see all of the members of the board again. And I'd like to formally thank Dr. Saito for the opportunity to serve uh, for a second term as faculty representative to the board. Um, you've all received my written report in which I tried to highlight some of the innovative ways faculty are approaching this unprecedented semester we have found ourselves in. Um, Sarah Moncure, our student representative, also did a wonderful job of highlighting the student experience on campus. And what I'd like to do is formally introduce Sarah to the board uh, and have her tell you a little bit more about our planned presentation for today. Good morning, I am Sarah Moncure. I'm the student representative to the board. Um, so this has been a truly unique semester for us here at RBC, um, especially since each student does have such a different degree of online and in-person classes. Um, 
Given this, Dr. Birdsong and I thought it would be an interesting idea to have a student panel of four students, myself included, just answering some questions. So that way we can delve further into what our experiences have been like this semester. So now I'm going to um, have my panel members introduce themselves. Um, Julia, Fulani, and Holden, would you share your name, where you're from, and if you're a freshman or sophomore? Hi, good morning. My name is Julia De La Pena. I am from Chester, and I'm a sophomore this year. My name is Holden Marone. Uh, I'm from Charlottesville, and I'm a first year this year. So this has been my entire college experience. Hi, um, good morning. I'm Talani Jasenha, and I'm from Ashburn, and I'm a freshman in Ridge Blanc College. Great. Well, thank you to the panel members for sharing a, a little bit about themselves. Um, before I kind of delve into my question, since I will be serving as moderator of this panel, um, I also wanted to share that part of why we chose this mode for today's presentation is that various clubs on campus will be using a panel format. Um, so for Psychology Club, we'll have different professionals coming in doing a virtual panel. Um, and I'm also working closely with student events and activities to create a a career fair virtually. So this is sort of a live example of what a panel would look like virtually. Um, I would also say that uh, currently how we're all presenting, which I did not know how this would happen, um, it gives you a good example of what's happening on campus. So we have Holden, Fulani, and Sarah who are streaming in from the dorms. Um, and Julia is with me from a safe distance um, in the SHE building. So kind of gives you a feel of, of how things are happening. So. Um, without further ado, I'm going to start just, um, I have approximately eight questions that I'll try to get to um, everyone at some point to share their experience. So um, I'm going to actually start with Holden. And Holden, what would you say is your favorite mode of teaching this semester um, and why? For me, uh, definitely still in person. So um, there's pros and cons to both in-person and asynchronous online, which are the only two modes that I'm participating in. Um, for example, asynchronous online, it gives you the opportunity to like to uh, choose when you do your work, but there's really no substitute for the interaction you can have with a professor in person in a class. And it also makes it easier to pay attention and retain the information when you're in a in-person class, at least personally for me. Great, thank you, Holden. And for the board members, I'll just go through these questions and then uh, leave remarks for the end if that's all right with everyone. I will add that Holden is in my in-seat um, class and has an exam at 2 p.m. So um, extra credit for that great presentation, Holden. Uh, my next question is going to be for Julia. Uh, what is a technology or application that you are using this semester that is new to you? So there's two new ones for me, um, Pull Everywhere, which I use at my anatomy class, which is very helpful. And I think it's better than someone in class at one point because everyone participates rather than the professor asking, attention, um, asking a question and just one specific student raising their hand and answering the question. So I think it's a great way for all of us to participate. Also, Zoom is very new for me this semester, which is, it was kind of weird at the beginning, but professors have been very kind. And what, one thing that I do see beneficial about Zoom is that a lot of professors are willing to help us outside of their office hours through Zoom, which I'm grateful for. Great, thank you, Julia. Uh, next question is going to be for Sarah, our student representative to the board. Sarah, has the increased flexibility with different teaching modes allowed you to use your time in different ways than you were able to last year? Yes, absolutely. So with this increased flexibility in my schedule, um, it's actually been very beneficial for my position as a resident assistant. I do um, really appreciate that I'm able to be in the dorms more and able to um, aid students most of the time, um, that has been great. And so I've also had more time to do community service and engage in campus activity as well. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next question is going to be for Thulani. 
what extracurricular activities have you been able to be involved with this semester um, despite the new normal uh, that we find ourselves in on campus? Um, I was able to attend like some of the in club interest meetings like the psychology club and also there's like some events organized by the, um, the residential life. Some of them are like online and some can be in person. So also I was able to volunteer, like apply for the volunteer positions in tutoring. And that's like for the this semester. Thank you. Um, for my next question, I'm going to return to Holden. Um, Holden, how do you think being in college for your freshman year during the COVID-19 pandemic might prepare you for your future career or your future transfer institution? The first, the, the main two ways that come to mind for me are being a self-starter, one, and managing my time. Um, in high school, I was able to kind of just cruise by and not study for some classes and do decently well, but that doesn't really work in college, uh, I found out. So with all the classes being, many of them being online, I've needed to adapt and learn how to set my own schedule, which I'm, is, I'm sure is gonna benefit me later in life. Um, and also being a self-starter, for example, I'm trying to play baseball when I transfer and nobody's gonna tell me, hey, you know, you do go practice right now. And so I've had to kind of motivate myself to do that. But fortunately, I've had enough time to do it since I can structure all my time the way I want to do it. Excellent. Uh, Julia, has there been a challenge for you this semester? Um, and how are you navigating that challenge? I think this is a personal, more of a personal challenge, but I think many students also face the same challenge. All my classes are aligned this semester, so therefore I'm at home most of the time. So I feel like the setting is kind of, I guess, a challenge for me because since I'm at home or in my room, it's kind of like I'm not in the mood to do homework, stuff like that. But my parents have been very helpful, so therefore they have um, changed one of the rooms to a study room for my brother and I. And also on certain days, I go to the public library and study there to focus and change the setting a little bit. All right, um, back to Thulani. Have you had one person or office on RBC's campus that has helped support your transition into college um, during this first year? And, and if so, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so like I was applying for the Promise Scholar and Honors Program. And before applying for that, uh, Celia Brock would help me a lot answering the questions like to transfer into the program and also like setting up the interview and like also like they, she directed me for the financial aid too, like the questions I had and also my learning mentor like choosing for the classes. He also helped me a lot. Thank you, Thulani. Um, and for our last formal panel question, um, this one's gonna go to Sarah. Um, Sarah, if you could go back to this time last year when you were a uh, first semester freshman at Richard Bland College, what is one piece of advice you would tell yourself to help you prepare for this fall semester? That's a good question. I think I would tell myself just because it's not the same doesn't mean it's bad um, and I think that has been something I've been adjusting to last year. I think it's really easy to be like, okay, I've got college down, you know, like I've got this. And then this year it's entirely different, but it's been a really great experience um, both years. So just because it's not different and it's not the same doesn't mean it's bad. Thank you, Sarah. And I think that's a good piece of advice for, for all of us, just because something doesn't look the way you plan for it to, it doesn't mean it's bad. Um, before I open it to the board for questions, I, I'd just like to note two things. Um, earlier, Dr. Desenberg spoke about our eight feeder schools. Um, and I think this is a, a good example of where we're seeing students come from other areas as well. So Julia is from one of those high schools, um, Holden's coming from Charlottesville, and then Sarah and Thulani from the Nova region. Um, and then lastly, I'll just speak a little bit. I'm teaching 
um, in seat from a socially distant place uh, in the auditorium. And I think it's just a, a good time to, to thank um, the facility staff who worked with me to set up the auditorium um, so that I could teach in seat, which was my preference, um, and who have been diligent, even as I'm on this call right now, um, are circling she, sterilizing everything, um, which has made a great experience for myself, um, but also for those students who would like to be in seat um, has allowed us to do that safely. Um, so at this time, I would open it up to the board for uh, any follow-up questions for our student panel. This is Barbara Johnson. Um, question, how are students um, or are students socializing at all? Are they getting to know each other on a social level or is everything strictly virtual like the panels that you mentioned? All right, so I can um, start. As I spoke about a little bit in my report, um, students are socializing in person and online. Um, the in-person socialization is, of course, strictly socially distanced. Um, there are activities such as yoga that students are getting to engage in um, and other things like that. During Welcome Week, we had a socially distanced mask tie-dyeing event, um, and there were other meet and greet type events um, in which like rules were strictly enforced. And um, so I would say it's a good combination of both. Um, I don't know about my panel members, what do you guys think? I would say that it's keeping that balance is really important. I think, especially since I'm living in the dorms, um, the Office of Residence Life has done a really good job with trying to find activities that people want to do, but are also safe uh, and socially distanced. And honestly, I think the best one would be the virtual, um, I'm trying to remember what they're called, but um, it's like hot tea and hot topics or something where we have a Zoom meeting and just talk about different topics that are going on, um, which is interesting, but it's also safe. And so that really stood out to me because it seems like a challenge for residence life to adapt to this, but they seem to have done a really good job. I would definitely say it's a mix of both, which I agree and I like. Um, at the very beginning, it was mostly virtually, but it was like the first week, meanwhile, like first week or two, meanwhile, we're all trying to settle and see what the students really wanted and what was the best for all of us. Um, I know Omar has worked very hard to set up things that we students want and set out um, things for us to like write down things that we would be interested in. And also, like, I know the Residence Life is doing, doing a good job and stuff, stuff like that. And they've even, like, also invited the commuters. I'm a commuter this semester, and they've done a great job on that. And also, when they were doing um, outside activities, therefore, we're socially distanced, they um, recommend to use the Handshake app. Therefore, you kind of, like, let them know ahead of time how many people are going to be there. So I think that's a great tool also to have a head count and all that. I might just add in there, uh, Julia just mentioned the Handshake app, which is um, a, a new uh, technology we were able to procure for this semester via a grant received last year. Um, and the goal is to help connect students with internships and jobs in the community. Um, but for us being a small campus, it's actually served really well to um, advertise virtual and on-campus events. Um, so normally we would have bulletin boards with really colorful flyers um, to help students uh, know what's going on on campus and while we do have that we need to reach students in a different way um, and handshake is an application that has allowed for that this semester other questions from the board for the student panel i would just like to give a grateful thanks um, to all of the students for number one, taking the time and, and um, how thoughtful you are in your responses. Um, please know of our support and thrill and Dr. Birdsong, thank you for getting together this uh, remarkable group and, and being with us. It just is an inspiration um, to hear all of you. So thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Any, any other questions for board members? Yeah, I want to echo uh, Karen's comments to um, you students really remind us why we do this work and why we um, read the tons of information we get and get into the weeds of the governance of uh, running a college and a university. And then to hear your perspectives keeps us grounded and focused on what it's really all about, making sure you have the best experience that you can have at, while you're attending Richard Blaine College. And um, I love your comments. I, I, I love your adaptability, your flexibility. Sarah, your comment about it's different, but it doesn't make it any worse. And I just really applaud you for your resilience and for your determination to uh, persevere through these unchartered times and waters that we all are experiencing. We're learning from you. So uh, thank you for being so um, courageous and so determined in what you are what you're setting out to do. So uh, we we appreciate you and all that you're doing. So thank you. And Mr. Branch, I just want to say thank you um, to the students for um, sharing your experiences and for to Dr. Bersan for leading this discussion, but also um, grateful to the administration for efforts to be aware of the importance of not having students isolated during this time and identifying activities and ways during which um, people can connect because I think that's so very important now more than ever. So thank you. Ms. Johnson, uh, if I may, I would ask uh, Celia to comment. Celia heads up student success. Omar, who was mentioned, uh, Julia, I think by you, uh, is in Celia's unit. Uh, someone else mentioned the learner mentors. I really appreciate your acknowledging uh, the important role that staff are playing to ensure that our students are engaged. So Celia, uh, what would you add? Um, I would add, first of all, great job to these students. It's so good to see them. <laughs> I miss seeing the students um, as often as I had. I, I would add that my, as Julia mentioned, Omar has put out um, a few surveys and been asking for input, and we really are looking for the students to guide us. We have not stopped the processes that we previously had in place as far as our interventions go. So we're you know, still keeping an eye on Dropout Detective, which provides us with some predictive analytics. Um, and the learner mentors are reaching out to those students, and they're registering the September Start students. And processes have been they're different because now the students do are required to set up an appointment, but everybody's adapting. The atmosphere has been really great. Um, and it has been great to have Omar on board as the campus engagement manager. And I know that he's coordinating with, with Tiffany on using Handshake. Um, and so we actually just had a conversation yesterday about some more events that we can, can have in addition to having the yoga that Sarah mentioned in person. Um, the We had an event for an NBA playoff game that was very popular. And when I say popular, I mean 30 students. I'm not talking we're at COVID capacity. <laughs> um, but we are really looking to, this, to the students and, and doing our best to engage them and to keep them informed um, in ways that works for them. And it's great that we have the Handshake app available um, to use because those it's it's apps that students are interested in using at least that's what we've heard from them and so uh, thank you for the acknowledgement and I just um, really look forward to continuing to serve the students um, from the advising and mentoring standpoint as well as with our student activities and keeping the students engaged. Well, see that that is excellent, and and Ms. Johnson, your point about the isolation is so so true and so critical that we we be very mindful of that. And what I was thinking about as the students were presenting is how 
you are in this unusual period, you don't have athletics, you don't have sports to bring you together, to rally around, to make you feel like one team, to make you feel like statesmen. Um, and so I applaud Celia and, and Omar's and all everyone's efforts in the administration to help the students understand how to connect safely in, in a social distance way that would make them all feel like statesmen still in spite of not having traditional things that bring us together. And Mr. Brown referenced the library's um, effort to chronicle and to journal these um, these times. Just think about this, students. This is this is an incredibly unusual period for all of us. And you're going to be able to tell your future kids one day how you survived on college campus where none of us old people like me can ever relate to. So think about where this is a badge of honor and be very, um, very uh, proud of how you are managing through this very challenging time and, and having the administration there and the faculty to support you like that is, is very, very special. So thank you again. Dr. Sato, any more reports from, from the staff and the administration? Mr. Chairman, uh, no, but if I could give a shout out to Dr. Birdsong and all of RBC faculty who have been, we've talked about flexibility this morning, and I think all of us have been astounded by the level of flexibility, creativity, and conscientiousness to ensure that we are continuing to deliver that high quality educational experience. Um, even in the midst of a pandemic, and that um, there are these wonderful uh, examples of playing to strengths, uh, meaning Dr. Birdsong uh, said that she preferred the in-seat face-to-face experience, and there are others who have preferred an online environment, and I think it's remarkable that the flexibility has enabled students, as you heard from this wonderful group of students, it has given them the flexibility and the options to plug into the educational experience in a way that, that is best for them, that makes sense for them. And faculty have been accommodating that by playing to their strengths and teaching and delivering instruction in a way that is best for individual faculty. So just a shout out to our magnificent faculty at Richard Bland College who have uh, not missed a beat. I think it's incredibly important to say the momentum is there. And in fact, I was talking to our director of academics, Mary Gurnick yesterday, and she was talking uh, just about how some of our senior faculty members have frankly been um, you know, rejuvenated, and they've gotten very excited about using technology. Some faculty members who hadn't been terribly excited about using technology previously have now gotten energized by the use of technology to um, advance, um, you know, learning in their discipline. So it's it's an exciting time, and I think that element can be lost as we focus on some of the underbelly of operating in this pandemic. There is a lot that is positive. And so I would like to just conclude our um, college uh, report to this committee with that reminder that there have been positives and our fabulous group has really emphasized the positive and tapped the positive um, during this time. Well said. And the only thing I could add to that, if I will, is that you all met this moment and you have just really stood in the, in the gap and rose to the occasion. So well done. Thank you, sir. All right, well, our action items, you received in your board materials, several resolutions, one through uh, four. And um, my recommendation, if there are no objections, is that we just vote on those as a block. Is there any discussion around those resolutions or questions? All right, we're hearing none. Is there a motion that we adopt these resolutions as submitted? 
So moved. Is second. 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 All righty. Uh, Mr. Fox, you call. Mr. Mr. Branch. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ms. Hudson. Aye. Judge Poston. Aye. Ms. Roday. Aye. And Ms. Schultz. Aye. Funding in the amount of 500. And sounds like the resolutions carry. Congratulations. Excellent. Our next item is um, that we move into closed session. And um, the Richard Mr. Blank Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I believe you had a resolution that you were planning to introduce um, before before closed session. Absolutely. And if you give me a moment. Um, Lisa can pull that up if you'd like. Would you, would you Lisa? That would be awesome. Thank you, President Sido. An additional resolution that we are recommending today is the Statesman Safe and Secure Employee Recognition. I will read this resolution and ask for the board uh, for a motion to approve it. Whereas in response to the COVID-19 pandemic on March 12, 2020, the governor of Virginia issued Executive Order 51, declaring a state of emergency in the Commonwealth. And on March 30, he issued a stay at home order to residents of the Commonwealth, Executive Order 55. Executive Order 55 required that institutions of higher education cease all in-person classes and instructions and cancel all gatherings for more than 10 individuals resulting in the immediate transition to remote teaching and learning and teleworking for all non-essential employees. And whereas since March 12th, Richard Blank College academic and administrative managers have functioned as an emergency management team meeting frequently to deliberate COVID related matters and to make informed decisions, big and small through consensus while remaining focused on the dual goal of fulfilling Richard Blank College's educational mission while at the same time, safeguarding the health of our campus community, a subcommittee of the COVID-19 crisis management response team, the Statesman Safe and Secure Task Force was established to develop and implement a plan for safely reopening the college on August 3rd. And whereas in June, the emergency management team collectively agreed that the racial justice and equity crisis that emerged in the midst of, pan of the pandemic also demanded immediate attention and action. With considerable input from academic leaders, a racial justice and equity task force was launched and work is now vigorously underway to identify, confront and alleviate racism and discrimination on campus. And whereas this, since the transition to remote instruction on March 30th and up to the present day, faculty have been remarkably conscientious and creative in their work to design and deliver effective online instruction that balances the distinctive, distinctive academic needs of RBC students with the protection of everyone's health and safety. Following a successful completion to the spring 2020 semester, faculty leaders maintain close and constant contact with faculty across disciplines to plan for a safe fall 2021 semester. And together they develop an array of classroom options to rotate students in seats or online in response to health considerations. Importantly, faculty gave students the flexibility to complete coursework in ways that were most comfortable and appropriate for them and their needs. And whereas throughout the entirety of the COVID-19 crisis, Richard Blaine College staff have consistently demonstrated the college's core community values and conscientiously adhere to COVID-related COVID policies and guidelines from the custodial staff who have worked diligently to disinfect and clean campus facilities to student success staff who have found new and creative ways to engage students and guide their academic progress to administrative staff who have been remarkably resourceful in delivering high quality processes and services both in person and online. Whereas since the outbreak of the COVID-19 crisis in the Commonwealth, the RBC faculty and staff have brought honor and distinction to the college through their selflessness and conscientious work 
And now, therefore, it be resolved by the Board of Visitors of the College of William & Mary that the board expresses its heartfelt appreciation and admiration of the employees across the RBC campus and be it further resolved that the board hereby supports the decision by President Sadow, Debbie Sadow, to make November 30th, 2020, Statesman Safe and Secure Employee Recognition Day that includes a paid day off. Here, here. That is our special resolution for today. Mr. Chairman, if I could just note uh, for purposes of the minutes, uh, this is being introduced at the request of President Sido, which is permitted under the bylaws. Uh, and it'll be HC1 is what it'll be labeled as, resolution HC1. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Fox. Is, is there a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Right. Been moved and second. Mr. Branch? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. Hudson? Aye. Mr. Poston? Aye. Ms. Roday? Aye. Ms. Schultz? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye, it's Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sado. Thank you, leadership team and everyone. We appreciate and hope you un can see how much we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Now, before I was so <laughs> eager to take us into closed session, uh, the Richard Bland Committee will return to open session following end of closed session for announcements and closing remarks. I will read the following motion. I move that the board go into closed session for the following reasons. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711-A-1, for discussion of the assignment, appointment, performance, and salaries of specific officers or employees, including the president. Pursuant to code, Virginia Code 2.2-3711.8, for consult, consultation with legal counsel regarding specific personnel matters requ requiring legal advice. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just note too for this closed session that this is for voting members of the board and legal counsel and two legal counsels only and President Sido. Mr. Yes. Branch. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Aye. Ms. Hudson. Aye. Mr. Aye. Poston. Aye. Ms. Roday. Aye. And Ms. Schultz. Aye. And Jessica will take you into closed session. you uh, like to read the open session certification? Thank you, sir. I move that we certify by roll call vote that to the best of each member's knowledge, only matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements under the Freedom of Information Act were discussed and only matters identified in the motion to have the closed session were discussed. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Schultz, Mr. Branch? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Judge Poston? Got Judge okay. Poston there? Did he come back? Yeah, he's back, he's on mute. Okay, all right, Judge Poston, I see you there. I, I think I saw your lips. Ms. Roday? Aye. <laughs> and Ms. Schultz? Yes, aye. Did you my bill yeah. That counts. <laughs> my, my internet's messing up. Yeah. It seems to be the a uh, lot of that going on. Yeah, it's a lot of that happening today. Goodness. Uh, don't jinx my system, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, any any new business for this committee to discuss? Okay, well, this has been a very, very productive and robust Richard Bland Committee meeting. I thank everyone for their engagement and their uh, support and their leadership of this amazing college and all the good work that the 
faculty, staff, and administration is doing at Richard Bland College. Um, we, it is a privilege and an honor to serve with this Board of Visitors on this committee, and we really appreciate all that, that you give to this work, and we thank you for it. If there are no other updates, then we will adjourn early and let the minutes reflect that I run an efficient, timely meeting. <laughs> Eight minutes back. Yes, and no complaints there. Is there is there a motion that we adjourn? So moved. Oh, second. It's been moved and second. We are adjourned. Everyone, please have a wonderful, wonderful day. Second. Stay safe, Excellent. everybody. Thank you all. Thank you all, and uh, we'll see you later this week. Some of us remotely, and some of us in person in Williamsburg. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie.